after the discussing a somewhat bigger event for next year. We were very much looking forward to again cooperating with you and continuing in this uh, very important cooperation with us. Uh, with these words, I will pass the floor uh, straight to the ambassador. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps you give your presentation and afterwards you have some time for questions and answers if that's okay with you. Thank you very much. No, a politician never gives time for questions. <laughs> You've just encouraged me to expand my intervention for a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Stephen, for uh, uh, hosting me. And it's, I'm very glad to be back at MedAx. Thank you for your intervention and to see uh, not only the, uh, the, the, the faces of um, uh, of students uh, here, but also the, the, the face of, uh, of friends from my, my stay, by, my stay uh, in, in Malta a few, a few years ago. And thanks for the, to the embassy for uh, organizing this, um, this event. So in, um, I, yes, in a few words, I want to, um, I want to give you a few, um, a few quick uh, brushes about the uh, ideas about the French, uh, the French vision of multilateralism uh, in uh, in times uh, in times of war, in times uh, because the with the focus be, being of course the uh, the present situation with the war of um, aggression on um, uh, on Ukraine, uh, and and let's try to, to, to reflect on that a little bit. Um, I think what we have um, uh, what we what we witness with the. Uh, uh, with the war in Ukraine is uh, is a basic uh, questioning and, um, uh, and 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 threat posed to the um, to, uh, to the fundamentals of our collective security as embodied by the Charter of the uh, United um, United Nations uh, respect for territorial integrity of states for the equality sovereign equality of states has been. Uh, is being challenged in the fundamental manner. Um, we, we will exchange on that, but it's not, it's not just another conflict. It has fundamental uh, repercussions. Uh, this its aggression has a worldwide effects. Uh, there are no countries in the world which do not suffer the, uh, the consequences of the conflict, whether it's on uh, their food security, um, or, um, or, or because principles that are essential to their own survival, you know, the sover sovereignty of states is, uh, uh, is, is in question. Um, Russia has no excuse. We, they were, we, Russia was given all possibilities to avoid this conflict. It is not true that no, we didn't speak, we didn't try to speak to Russia. And I, I can even say that President Macron, in the case of France, was heavily criticized for talking to Russia uh, as, as long as he could in order to find a way, a way out. Um, the fact that it is Russia makes it, as I said, a fundamental uh, questioning of, the, uh, of the, the United Nations system. Uh, and, and, and a very particular attack on the Charter of the United Nations because Russia, of course, historically, is a pillar of the United Nations. Again, as I said, it's not any war, and it's not any state. It is Russia, a permanent member of the Security Council. Uh, being a permanent member of the Security Council uh, gives, you, uh, gives you mainly responsibilities. And, and, and Russia is, uh, is acting again against, sorry, the, um, uh, this responsibility that it was given to contribute to peace and security in the world. Um, as I said, uh, no country is immune to this, uh, to this conflict. Um, the consequences um, are, are immense because, in a way, uh, this action by Russia has fragmented the international order, makes it, makes it very difficult for the United Nations, as we know it, to, uh, to work. And, um, and that will be my, my, my second point, um, by its action, 
it, um, it gives the idea to some states that maybe the United Nations is not the right solution any, any longer. And uh, you can see it when you, uh, when you had votes in the Security Council and, and, and um, Russia vetoed resolutions in the Security Council and prevented the Security Council from acting. If you read the explanation of votes of a few countries after this vote by Russia, sometimes the tone in the explanation of votes was uh, a nuance even uh, among like-minded countries of Europe or, um, of Af or Africa, uh, which were sharing the same, um, the same, or Latin America, which were sharing the, the same opposition to, uh, and the regrets for Russia's veto. But sometimes you could hear an undertone that maybe this veto demonstrated that the United Nations system was not relevant anymore. And the target was becoming the United Nations itself and its inability uh, to address fundamental issues um, of our time. You've heard it, I wouldn't, you hear it in other fora. Um, a, few, a few months ago in the Human Rights Council, you had a, um, a resolution on, on human rights in China, which was introduced and uh, which, um, which was um, uh, not successful. Uh, a majority of states in the Human Rights Council voted against this resolution. And again, when you hear comments about this, um, uh, what is a failure for human rights, uh, you, you hear comments that maybe this is uh, a proof of the inefficiency and um, of, of the UN system, of the UN Commission, Cons Council for Human Rights, uh, more than the fact that states, states bear the responsibility of, of not having um, found a, a majority on this text. And, and I would say French, fr the French position is very, is very distinct, uh, separate from such thinking. Um, we think that the uh, uh, the present situation is serious, but it, it calls for a renewed commitment to the Charter of the United Nations and to, uh, and to multilateralism. Um, we, uh, there are you know, various expressions I can use, don't throw the water, no, don't throw the baby with the, yeah. with the water of the bath, or don't shoot don't shoot at the ambulance, whatever the expression, you see what I mean, the responsibility um, lies with the, the use that is being made of the system, but probably not the system itself, and probably that would be our, um, our recommendation. Collective action and support to an efficient multilateralism are, are probably the, the, the best response rather than attacks on the, um, on the system. I'm not watching uh, the camera as I should. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, and, um, and so we see the situation as calling for uh, more action to preserve the, to preserve the system. Um, and uh, I would say action that goes a little bit in all, in all directions. Uh, and I come to this, uh, to those uh, necessary action to, to make sure that multilateralism remains uh, relevant and, and becomes even more um, efficient. Uh, first of all, I, uh, the international system, and the UN in particular, has to show that faced with an obstacle, like a veto in the Security Council, it has the agility and the inventiveness necessary to go and, and, and address or tackle the issue in another forum. Uh, and this is what we did when we were faced with um, uh, the veto in the Security Council. We used the United for Peace resolution uh, and we moved to, uh, to the General Assembly. And in the General Assembly, uh, we adopted a number of texts um, that have been very relevant in dealing with the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, the adoption 
at a, a, a quite an incredible, I would say, that quite a, a, a very impressive majority uh, in the United Nations General Assembly uh, of the resolution condemning the annexations of territory, of the illegal annexation of territory by, by Russia with a vote of 143 in favor on only five against, um, has, some will say, no effect wrong. It has, it had a tre tremendous consequences. It, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations said it himself very clearly. With such a vote, the UN has said the law. And the law is clearly, those annexations are illegal. Uh, and, and it goes much beyond uh, just simple words uh, in a resolution. It's, uh, it's an unprecedented uh, to, to have a, uh, a permanent member of the Security Council's action condemned in such a way uh, and, and so clearly uh, by, by, the, by the General Assembly. So, so the General Assembly, even though we will say it has no enforcing power, has shown efficiency and relevance by doing this. It has um, reassured a lot of states, uh, not only in Europe, but also in Africa, in Latin America, and elsewhere in the mi Middle East, that the principles of um, uh, equality of nations and respect for sovereignty were still relevant. And that was a message that, uh, that we needed to hear. Another, um, another, uh, way for the UN to show its, um, its relevance and efficiency was to really address the challenges of the war in Ukraine, but also I would say show the capacity to address global challenges um, uh, in, um, uh, as, as they come. You know, we have global challenges up to the, it's up to the UN to find uh, global, uh, global responses. In the case of, of specific case of Ukraine, this was demonstrated uh, by um, the reaction of the UN uh, when faced with the consequences on the war, of the war on the food security in a number of, of countries in, in Africa. Um, the, the general mobilization of uh, agencies in um, of the UN agencies in Rome, what we call the Rome agencies, uh, the FAO, World Food Program, and, and IFAD. The way they mobilized in order to help, um, uh, or to help set up the convoys of grain towards the countries in Africa which needed it under the, um, under the auspices of the uh, Secretary General's initiative, uh, um, grain, uh, grain in the Black Sea, grain from the Black Sea, uh, was exemplary, was a model. And then you had uh, the way um, we also managed with those organizations to, uh, to make sure that fertilizers, which were blocked um, uh, in Europe uh, due to sanctions, would actually uh, reach in time uh, countries which needed to save their crops and it's been called the Save Crops uh, Initiative and it's still, um, it's still ongoing. Um, it's uh, for having been involved in, um, in organizing those different, these different initiatives, they really requested everybody to work together, the UN, the EU, individual states um, and I thought, I thought that was a pretty uh, impressive effort and bearing witness to that, that a number of countries um, uh, more recently, um, uh, when we were in the um, Francophonie Summit in Gerba, you had a lot of countries coming to us and say, oh, this seems to be working, can we also benefit from this system? So, um, and and the, 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 the talent, I would say, of the World Food Program and other organization is having transformed very quickly what, was, what could have been a one-shot organization into a mechanism. So that's an example. But of course, beyond, beyond Ukraine, um, uh, you have, be, uh, beyond Ukraine, regarding Ukraine, but also going beyond this, this conflict, uh, we have to real, 
we're we see every day um, to what extent organizations which might have sounded at one time not secondary but maybe technical organizations in the in the UN sphere like the uh, um, International um, Technology uh, Union UIT. My, I, I should say, I'm speaking in English, my, my, my notes are in French, so <laughs> <laughs> sorry if sometimes I'm not using exactly <laughs> the, the right word, but all of a sudden the, tra the translation of UIT has escaped me. You also had, um, so you have this organization working on uh, telecommunication, you have the organization of civil aviation, you know, quite organization doing just technical work in, in Montreal? No, essential organization to organize, uh, to organize international uh, interaction in a, world where, uh, in a world where security is at risk because major uh, air powers are, uh, are on the opposite side. Uh, WHO, I mean, you know, it's, it's impossible to say that to, nowadays, after the pandemics, that WHO is just <coughs> another technical organization uh, in, the, in the UN sphere. It is obvious that it is at, uh, at the center uh, of, the, um, of those uh, fighting to ensure a, a, a future to, our, um, uh, to the young generation, and I don't even need to to speak to you about, um, about climate. Malta has been <laughs> involved enough into uh, COP, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, climate issues since COP21 and, and before uh, with, um, uh, to, to, to know how important the UN response is to, uh, to, fight, um, uh, to fight climate change. Um, I should say that I've, uh, out of my meetings with the um, uh, with the MOFA, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of Malta, and um, uh, today I was struck that they are planning during their presidency to bring back to the Security Council another issue, uh, which uh, is very relevant, which is o oceans, mm -hmm. and uh, they will bring it in the Security Council with with a focus on uh, on security, of course, uh, but. Uh, it is definitely a, a, an issue with um, a, a, a universal, of universal, universal interest. So, uh, the relevance of the international system uh, to me, is, to, to us, remains obvious even in those times of crisis. However, uh, to remain uh, to remain relevant, you also have, you know, you you must also renew yourself and you must reform yourself. And that's, a, uh, that's something we, we try to apply to all of us, but of course this applies also to the United Nations. Uh, we renew our trust and we renew our commitment to the UN, but to a renewed and reformed United Nations. Uh, and that applies to, to a range of issues. Um, Usually the first issue I broach in, uh, in, in my intervention is reform of the Security Council. I will reverse, because there were other issues with, um, there are other issues with the United Nations and we shouldn't shy away from, from saying it. There are major issues of governance in the United Nations. Uh, it's, it's a lot about representativeness and inclusiveness. And, uh, but also it's about leadership, <coughs> it's about uh, being, um, uh, being a model in the fight of, of, against all forms of discrimination, not only when you, when you speak to states and when you, uh, you speak in international meetings, but also within the organization. Um, so uh, zero tolerance for uh, discrimination of any kind, it applies to everybody, zero, zero tolerance for uh, discrimination based on gender or on the, the rights of persons uh, in, you know, uh, in any case, that's uh, essential. And the UN might not have been so uh, uh, such a model in the past and it's important you know, a lot of improvements have been made, 
but it's important uh, that, um, that the issue uh, is at the forefront of the reform within the United Nations and the Secretary General has been in the, in the lead of that, on that. So governance, definitely uh, uh, governance of the, different, uh, of the different institutions in the UN. And then reform uh, in one of the most emblematic uh, institutions of the United Nations, which is the security, um, the security Council. And here, uh, I see a danger. I see the danger that we speak of the reform of the Security Council and we feel, okay, let's repeat the usual positions and everything is very comfortable and France will remain a permanent member of the Security Council and nothing will happen. So I can sit back, make a speech and then not act and, and uh, everything is fine. And that's, uh, that's not our position because in fact it's not comfortable. It's, uh, the present situation uh, obviously uh, will create even more distrust for the, for the Security Council, for the, its lack of representativeness um, and for its lack of, uh, of efficiency. And, um, and I really insist on that for France, it's really a question, uh, a very urgent question uh, to, to achieve some, some reform of the Security Council. You have very, uh, you have different position, even within, you know, within Europeans, you have a very specific position of the Africa continent. Um, and we have not progressed on the issue of representativeness. And um, um, as I said, uh, some sometimes might feel, oh, it's a pretty comfortable position, nothing is changing. I don't, I really think it's, it's dangerous. So not being able to address very urgently uh, th those issues, we've tried to, to focus our efforts uh, on, the, on the veto right in the Security Council. We have launched with Mexico and it's now supported by maybe 106. and Sorry, I'm asking because apparently uh, we, there, was, uh, there was one or two, one or, or two new, um, new supporters in the, in the past week. So 106 countries within the UN are supporting the principle of self-limitation by the members of the Security Council of the veto uh, of exercising the right of veto in cases of mass atrocities. We have to, um, uh, and for the first time this year, um, the United States, while not exactly supporting this, uh, uh, these dynamics, has spoken in favor of a reform of the, of the use of veto that should only be used in rare and exceptional circumstances. It's much less specific, of course, than mass atrocities, but I guess it creates, uh, it creates some form of movement, some form of movement, and uh, maybe there is a window of opportunity. Uh, now that we've, we have, as France, we have announced that we, even though other members of the Security Council had, had not made the announcement, we did it, uh, we did um, uni unilaterally, we announced that we would, uh, we commit to refraining from the use of veto in the case of mass atrocities. Uh, we need to be to go a bit further, and we we'll try this year is to think about the mechanism by which, for instance, the UN Secretary General or the General Assembly or another mechanism would actually say, "Oh, and this situation now examining the Security Council is a situation of mass atrocity," which means that we would be in fact bound not only by our own uh, announcement but by this um, this triggering either by the by the uh, Secretary General or by, by another institution. And uh, I'm mentioning that because it's a small thing, but it, uh, we, need, we need to move. We need to move because uh, this paralysis of the reform of the Security Council, as I said, is totally, is totally counterproductive for those of us who want to prove the relevance of the system. Uh, I speak too long, but um, uh, two other points to, to ensure this um, uh, to improve the uh, efficiency of the UN. First of all, the, the UN is, is a very wi wide, of course, and sometimes unwieldy body. Um, so it is useful within the UN to
to, to go through the regional organizations when it's possible. There is still a, a huge margin uh, to work with uh, regional organizations. We have worked with African Union and, and, uh, and others to, um, in the field of peacekeeping, for instance, or, or others. Uh, to make sure that um, the missions are more adapted to the, uh, the regional situation, but much, much more need to be done. But even beyond regional organizations, we have found it very useful to, to build alliances and partnership on specific subjects um, which, with countries from all regional groupings, or um, uh, they're more it's, it's, it's very flexible, it allows you know, some countries who might not agree on one subject, but ah, we agree on the freedom of information. So let's create together a partnership for freedom of information and fighting fake news, etc. And we work together on this. And it allows sometimes some countries to, to go away from the traditional position uh, of uh, some countries including including us for, to go away from our traditional position and try to, to work on another subject together. The only limitation, uh, limitation the only condition so for, for such efforts to work, if it's, we, we all agree that we are converging towards the essential, which is in the end support for the, 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 the UN Charter and, and principle. And so this has been quite, uh, we have an alliance for multilateralism, we have other uh, other partnership and it, this has been uh, quite efficient. And as I say, one small from the caveat, caveat um, those must not become uh, clubs mm -hmm. where everybody feels that oh, we are the we are the you know we are the most relevant. We we know the subject. We are the richer, or we we are the ones <coughs> with. Uh, more, more uh, military power, so after all, our club could very well be the alternative to the United Nations. That's the, that's the one uh, limitation we have to, the, the, the one caveat I was thinking about. Yes, alliances, partnership, groups like uh, the G7 and the, G, the, the G20, the, the, they are useful if they converge, because they, they converge towards supporting the objective of the United Nations. If not, it becomes, as I said, an idea of, a, of an alternative world government with very limited, uh, limited uh, membership. And that's definitely not what we're aiming at at the moment when we, we are on the opposite, trying to enlarge the security currency. Um, last, um, last point, and uh, quite sensitive when we speak about um, relevancy and efficiency of the United Nations. Uh, there is a sense sometimes that because the emphasis nowadays is a lot about Ukraine and the, the, the Russian war on aggression on Ukraine, that somehow all the subjects have disappeared from the surface of the table, and certainly not from the surface of the earth, but, um, but that they're not debated um, uh, anymore, we, uh, I, I have heard, um, I have heard this um, this narrative, um, and I think it's important that we don't uh, that we don't ignore this concern. Um, I think it's more it's it's a question of uh, of visibility and communication because at, I, uh, at no point uh, in the United Nations, a country like France, which has um, Mediterranean interest, a very specific interest in its relationship with, with Africa, the Sahel, and um, uh, Middle East, Northern Africa has, um, has uh, uh, diminished its attention to, to, the, to the crisis in other regions uh, of the world. Um, whether you know, we have successes or not is another issue, but definitely the, the focus is still here. Um, we were discussing in the in the car with the, with the ambassador. We are all of us um, uh, of a generation when we remember that France opposed the war in Iraq, <laughs> and uh, that was one of our historical stan uh, stance. And we remain very engaged in the in this region. We have organized a Baghdad one conference, and we think there is a, now a Baghdad two conference coming up for the uh, for the. the, the examine the situation in the whole region. 
Syria has, it, of course, is at the forefront of our concern. The situation in the uh, occupied uh, territories, I mean, maybe and during the General Assembly, this was uh, the object of, uh, uh, of long negotiations where we, um, uh, where we, we, we try to bring, um, uh, to bring the Europeans to, to consensus with, um, uh, with our colleagues from, from Palestine. So those issues are, are really remaining very, very high on the agenda. Um, and uh, maybe here, I, would, uh, I think I would recognize that maybe there is an effort to, to be done on the, uh, on the public diplomacy side to maybe emphasize uh, that yes, the war in Ukraine is draining a lot of our energy and, and, and efforts because it has implications for all those regions and so we have to, uh, we have to deal with it. Um, but we wouldn't, uh, but the United Nations where there would be, um, uh, but there would be double standards and the lack of consistency uh, in our objectives would definitely not be the, uh, uh, the reformed, uh, renewed, efficient uh, organization. Uh, that we uh, that we stand for. Thank you very much for your Thank attention. You. And Thank so we you. have to go. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>